Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's, before we have the word, let's, let's just pray. Jesus, we just pray that you would deliver your word this morning, almighty God. There would be your word amongst us, Lord God. Your word in our lives. We give you worship and we give you all the glory this morning, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to start off by reading from Galatians 5, verse 16. And it says this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these two are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things you please. I'm going to read the first bit again. I say, walk by the Spirit. And today I'm going to be looking at the phrase that appears quite a few times in the New Testament, in the Spirit. Paul tells us here that we are to walk in the Spirit. So I want us to understand what it is and the significance that it has upon our lives and upon our walk with God. So each of us as humans has a spirit. The spirit is our life. It is our drive. It is where our desires come from. It's a lot of where our character comes from. That's the human spirit. And before we knew Jesus, we lived our lives just driven by that, driven by whatever it is that drives us. Maybe it's being driven by success or by power or by comfort or by money or whatever it is that drives each and every one of us. That comes from our spirit. Our spirit is where our desires are. Our spirit is, is, is almost where our heart is in, that, in the right sense. Galatians 5, 19 says this. So when the Bible talks about being driven by our spirit, Paul calls it the works of the flesh. Anything that comes out of our spirit, anything we do out of our own self, Paul, comes, Paul calls the works of the flesh. And it says here, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when we were dead in our sins, we only had our human spirit and we're driven from them. And these are some of the signs of the works of our flesh that come out of our spirit. But when we become born again, when we meet Jesus, he fills us with his spirit. Amen. Now his spirit is a Holy Spirit, but it works in the same way as the human spirit. It is the character and the heart of God. First of all, it's the life of God. It's his heart, it's desire. The Holy Spirit reveals to us who Jesus is. It reveals truth to us. It reveals God's will to us. It reveals God's purpose to us. And Paul is saying here, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. So in each one of us, when we become born again, see, before we're born again, there's no battle within us. We're just driven by our spirits, our human spirits. We do what we want. And in a sense, everything's fine. But when we become born again, God fills us with his spirit and suddenly there's a battle within us. There's a battle that rages in each one of us about who we're going to follow. Are we going to follow our human desire or are we going to follow the spirit of God? So the spirit of God is the will of God. The spirit of God is the desire of God. The will of God, the spirit of God, sorry, reveals the heart of God. So we're living in a time of battle, a battle about who we're going to follow, the Holy Spirit, his will, his way, or our flesh. In Romans 8, those who live according to their flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. See, the mind governed by flesh is death but the mind given by the spirit is life and peace 
The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law and nor can it do so. But those of us and those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. We cannot please God with our own spirits. We cannot please God with our own works. Even if they're okay by the world's standards. Even if we're not necessarily doing evil things, inverted commas. What we produce out of ourselves, we cannot please God with. The only way we can have that effective Christian walk, the only way we can advance the kingdom of God, is to walk by the Spirit. So what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? This is what Jesus says. When Jesus called the disciples, what did he say to them? He says, follow me. Follow me. And this is the gospel. This is the gospel that Jesus would say to us. Follow him. Let's read from Matthew 4. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come and follow me. Come and follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, at once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called to them. Immediately, they left their boats and their father And they followed him. When the call of Jesus came upon their lives, they left everything. They left their livelihood. They left their family. Because the gospel is this. The gospel is to follow Jesus. The gospel is to follow Jesus. We sometimes misinterpret it about making Jesus follow us. See, Jesus hasn't come just to give us a more comfortable life in the world. That's not what the gospel is. That Jesus calls us out of the world. That we can live in him. And follow him, even though it may be the harder way. Even though when we turn to him and get filled by the Spirit, we do suddenly start having a battle within us. It was easy before, before we knew him, there was no conflict within us. We didn't know right from wrong. We only knew what we desired. And yet when we turn to him, when we're filled with his Spirit, there's a conflict. So to follow him isn't the easy way, but it's the true way. So if we're going to walk with him, if we're going to follow him, that means we follow Jesus on his terms. It means we come before him and say, Jesus, what do you want? And the only way we can know this is through the Holy Spirit. The only way we can know is through the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit reveals the thoughts and the desire and the truth of Jesus. That's what he does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. See, what I'm talking about today is maturity. This is maturity. When we're young Christians, everything's done for us. And God kind of does everything for us, just like a little child. But as we grow up, we realise there's responsibility. As we grow up, we realise, actually, it's not right that everything is done for us. But rather, we mature and become people who understand what it is to follow God. Not to be served all the time, but to serve, to follow him to follow his way. See, the gospel, the true gospel is based on sacrifice. Obviously, Jesus is sacrifice. And this isn't negating grace, but it requires sacrifice from us to follow him. Now, Romans 8 says this, and this is a hard verse. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Those, do you want to know who's a child of God and who isn't? Actually tells us here. Those who are led by the Spirit of God. Wow. And that's quite, that. if you get your head around what that's saying and the impact that has on our lives, those who are led by Him, they are the children of God. So when Paul says walk in the Spirit, this is what he's saying. He's saying be led by Jesus. Leave your life behind. Leave your desires that come from your flesh behind and let's follow him, Jesus, his way on his terms. But this phrase in the spirit isn't just about walking with him. It also tells us in Ephesians 6, and pray 
in the Spirit on all occasions with all kind of prayers and requests. Pray in the Spirit. Not only are we told to walk with Him, we're told to pray, how? In the Spirit. So praying in the Spirit is the same thing as walking in the Spirit. It means we're going to pray according to what God is doing and saying. That's what it means to pray in the Spirit. When we, when we learn the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, how does it start? Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Now we all learned it, so most of us learned it in primary school, so we, we learned it in the old King James Version as well, so we always say it like that. But our Father in heaven... So the, when we told us to start off praying, he told us to start off by worshipping. Yes. Worship our Father in heaven. Holy is your name. We come in. We can't even pray on our own. We can't pray out of our flesh. There's a way we're taught how to pray. And that's by, first of all, acknowledging there is a holy and a righteous Father. Our Father in heaven. Holy is your name. And then what's the next line? Again, we'll say the old King James. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. As it is in heaven. So praying in the spirit, how God wants us to pray, pray in the spirit on all occasions, it comes from, it comes from who God is. It comes from acknowledging. So when God told us how to pray, he starts off by seeking him. He starts off by saying, God, not my will, but your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what prayer is. And then it goes into requests, and it's right, obviously, requesting from God is right. But once we've acknowledged him, once we're in that place of worship with him, then we can pray properly. Because a place of worship brings us into unity with him. That's what we're doing when we're doing the music in inverted commas. We're not doing music, hopefully. We're doing more than that. We're doing worship. We are worshipping him and coming into unity with him. And when we're with him in that place of unity, then we can pray in his will. And I'll guarantee you, this is when we see prayers answered. When we don't see prayers answered, very often they're very fleshly, um, human spirit-based prayers. That's why we don't always see results in them. But when we're praying in what he has, I remember I was, I was speaking in India once and I was speaking to this church in a town. And it was about half full. And, was, and you know, people were mildly interested. <laughs> and then at the end of the service, and then when the service finished, it came time to pray for people. And suddenly there was a queue all the way around this town, this village, literally as far as the eye could see for people wanting to be prayed for. None of them were interested in the service. They weren't interested in the word of God. But as soon as someone's praying for them, it's almost like we have the mentality of, of God's a genie and he's going to correct his three wishes. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is so much deeper than that. Prayer is bringing down the will of God, of a holy God, your will, done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's people who can pray like that effectively, effective fervent prayer. These are the people who see a change. This is how we're going to change Withenshaw and Manchester by praying in his Holy Spirit, by praying what he wants, by praying his kingdom. His ki we can pray for ourselves, and there's a rightness to pray for ourselves. It does tell us to ask. So there's a rightness, and we can get it for ourselves. Great. But there's so much bigger work than this that Jesus has for us. There is a bigger work and we can only do that work by his spirit. And we can only do that because Jesus died and sent his Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus says it's good that he goes away. Yeah. It was a good thing. Because we couldn't all literally follow a physical Jesus around this world. It wouldn't work. So he said it's a good thing that he goes away. Because it means he can send his Holy Spirit. That fathers us. That shows us the way. That directs us. But reveals the heart of God to us. That's what he does. See, in our old days, we couldn't pray in the kingdom of God. We had no idea what it was. We had no idea what God's heart was for the lost. We had no idea what God's heart was for anything. We were only capable of praying for what we needed, like little children. But his Holy Spirit reveals his purpose. So he tells us to walk in the Spirit. And he tells us to pray in the Spirit. 
But there's also a third thing he tells us to do in the Spirit. From John 4, 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come because the Spirit's come when his true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks because God is Spirit and his worshippers must worship in Spirit and in truth. So it says it so clearly here, God is Spirit. God is Spirit. The only way we can worship him effectively is in the Holy Spirit. It says here, this is the kind of worshippers the Father is looking for. He's seeking people who are going to get in line with him. And there's times in here when our worship, I hope, touches him. There are times when we get in the Spirit. And there's times when we come into that unity with him. And that, and it doesn't have to be in here, in our own lives as we're worshipping at home. Again, it doesn't need to have music. But when we're worshipping, when we're pouring out to God, his Holy Spirit leads us. And it brings us into unity with him. I believe... That when we're worshipping correctly in the spirit, I believe heaven joins in with us and gets behind us. I really, really do. And that's when we see a change. That's when we see a transformation. We often sing Heart of Worship, the song, I'll bring you more than a song. Because a song in itself is not what you require. It's not about knocking out the latest worship tunes. There is so much more than that. But worshipping in the spirit means being led by him, being led by his heart, being shown by him. And I believe, obviously, there's worship going on in heaven, which I'm sure is amazing. But I believe there's something special about those of us on the earth, in a fallen world, where we could do anything we wanted to with our Sunday mornings. There's something special about those who are able to worship even amongst what we have around us, even amongst the miserable weather, even amongst our problems, even amongst everything that's going on in our family or wherever and whatever is going on. There is something special about those of us who can worship him. And I know God crowns us, crowns us with his anointing, with his favour as we worship him in spirit and in truth. So we're told to walk in the Spirit. We're told to pray in the Spirit. We're told to worship in the Spirit. And even more than that, it tells us if we're not in the Spirit, we're not actually praying, we're not walking, and we're not worshipping, unless it is by His Holy Spirit. Unless it is by His Holy Spirit. These are the people God is looking for. Those who will sell themselves out People, God is looking for people who just like when Jesus called the fishermen and he said, follow me. They didn't argue. They didn't argue for a second. They left their businesses. They left their family. Said, God, I'm going to follow you. I am going to follow you. I am going to follow you. I am going to follow you. And just as they could do it physically with a physical Jesus, so we can do it because of the Holy Spirit. We can do it exactly the same way. And the same calling is upon each of us. Each of us of how deep we want to go. How far do we want to go? Are we prepared to give everything up? Are we prepared to give our comfort up? Are we prepared to give up what we like? What our human spirit desires? Are we prepared to give it up so we can pray in the spirit? So we can worship in the spirit? So we can follow him? Because I'll tell you, the people who do that are the people who will carry God's authority. They are the people who will carry God. See, we can all say words. We can all say the words of Jesus. But for them to have authority is when he speaks through us. It's when it's Jesus speaking through us. That's what we can have as a people, as individuals. And I believe that's what we have as a church. And we're going to continue having as a church. People who pray, worship, talk, walk in the Holy Spirit as we are sold out to him. As we are set apart from him. One both of you around. Would you mind coming up? And then, when we do all these things, Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit 
through the bond of peace. See, a church, and I love this church. I really have been here about a year and a half. I honestly love this church. Unity comes by the Spirit. Why is that? Because we have one purpose. Because there is one purpose. When there is one purpose, we don't care about ourselves. We don't care about our titles. We don't care about our positions. We don't care about who said what or this or that or the other. It's irrelevant. Unity in the Spirit means we are unified in a desire for Him. Unified in a desire for Jesus. That's what He has for us. Again, it all comes through the Holy Spirit. So how, how do we follow him? It's very simple. It begins with a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of saying, Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. And I'm going to follow you where you want to go. I'm going to pray what you want me to pray in. I'm going to, I'm going to worship how you want me to worship. I'm going to, I'm going to talk and minister to people how you want me to talk and minister. Because God, I've got nothing of my own. What I say to people has no impact. But the Spirit of God through me creates an impact. And then, after all these things, Galatians 5, 22, the fruits of the Spirit. See, the fruits aren't the Spirit themselves. The fruits are what the Spirit produces. In the same way that an apple tree cannot help but produce apples, it can try and produce oranges all at once. It's never going to happen. It's just a natural scientific outpouring of what it is. An apple tree produces apples. And so people who have the life in the Spirit of God, people who live in the Spirit of God, have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You can't not help. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against all these things, there is no law. There is no law left for those who follow the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the law. For those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us follow Him. Again, this is what Paul's writing in all of Galatians and some of his other books as well. Keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Paul got up to an amazing place in, in Galatians 5. Somewhere, I can't think of the verse. But he says this, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. What an amazing thing to be able to say, I no longer live. I no longer live. But my life's been given over to following the Spirit of God. My life's been given over to seeking Him. My life's been given over to following Him, to ministering to Him, to praying Him, to, to, to do what He has me do. I no longer live. I, I, I can't honestly say I've got to that point, but that's my ambition in life. That is my ambition in life. I would love at my end of days to be able to say, I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Yes. Because when Christ lives in me, when Christ lives in me, then I'll only speak what Jesus is speaking. I'll only pray what Jesus is praying. I'll only go where Jesus is going and I will carry him. I will carry him when we're ministering to people. He will give us his words because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives us truth. He gives us truth. When we're going out into our communities, when we're going to the workplace, we should be people so filled with him. We can't help but speak truth over people, transforming them. I remember I was giving music lessons to this guy once and he was really dour, really quite a depressed guy. And I'd, I'd, I'd been teaching him for a few weeks and he came in once and I said, do you know what? You think this, this, and this about your life, all negative stuff. I said, let me tell you the truth. And I started just speaking over it. It wasn't a big spiritual thing, but I just started speaking right things over his life. And I saw his face transformed, absolutely transformed, because spirit of life had come into him. He'd probably never heard it in his life. This is what we do, even when we're doing our secular jobs. 
we carry that life and that truth, that Holy Spirit. All this comes from Jesus. All this comes from Jesus, from laying our lives down and worshipping Him. Can I have the worship team back up? We're just going to continue worshipping Him. We're going to continue worshipping Him as He reveals His truth.